I've been crowing on for weeks now about how whenever I'm up in Scotland working on Allen, it's blue skies and general benign serenity. Evidently that's over, so let's come to terms with rain before we strive onward. I'm going to introduce you to a zone of the main electrics panel that I've never even mentioned before, what I call the high power circuit. It comes from the same 24 volt source as the low power circuit, but is destined for inversion to AC. It has its own 125 amp fuse, which is suitably sensible of it, but it does have two wires sticking out of the side of the panel. But no fear, one end is taped and the circuit is isolated, and remember that fuse will save us all from catastrophe. My first job, having double checked it's all switched off and safe, was to remove the tape and get rid of the buck crimp connectors I put on the end of those high current silicon jacketed wires ages ago. I assumed back then that continuous wires would head onward somewhere, but instead I've decided to put some plugs and sockets in at this point. Andersons of course, and these are the beefy ones that can handle well over 200 amps. I don't need more than 125 amps at the absolute most, but the Andersons one level down were a little small. I mentioned this before, and for those of you unfamiliar with these heavy duty, yet not waterproof, non-gendered connectors, a couple of things. Firstly, you buy the housings in the pins separately. Secondly, hyperflexible silicon wires aren't quite stiff enough to click into place, especially thinner gauge ones. So I tend to use a flathead screwdriver to guide the pins into their seats. I now, using the same connectors and process, need to make a 3 meter extension to send all this power to another part amongst the innards of Allen. Despite using a hex tool, my crimps aren't hex, nor very pretty, but are very effective. No amount of yanking can release them, and there's perfect continuity. As if to completely discredit my complaint just seconds ago, but perhaps because these wires are so thick and I'm now more practiced, but I was able to click the pins into the housing with just a force of a thumb. You do need to make sure the pins are in the right orientation, as they can half click if the wrong way up, and you only find out when you try and mate two connectors together. My general policy for running cables, wherever possible, is to do so on the ceiling. This is for safekeeping and leaving other areas uncluttered, but also for safety in case of flooding. As usual, I have these D-link lengths of semicircular self-adhesive conduit to carry them back to the racking area. This is the run, from the electrics panel and the immediate Anderson terminal for flexibility, then the distance a meter or so forward, and then a drop down to the middle shelf of the racking. Don't worry, the cables won't just dangle there for long, and behold, there's something at the end. As a stroke of, I guess I wouldn't say luck, but it happened and so I'm working with it, on the last trip, the final leg up to here in Scotland, we unfortunately had my old modified sine wave inverter die. It went pop, one of the capacitors went, and it's now with someone else who's gonna try and fix it and use it. Anyway, I've decided to then upgrade to one of these. This is a step up in a number of ways, even in the voltage sense. See what I did there, electrics people. It's a 24 volt DC to 230 volt AC pure sine wave inverter, rated for up to 1500 watts with short bursts of up to 3000 watts. It's a well regarded company and slightly harder to come by than the one sourcing from 12 volts. Anyhow, it's not complex. There's a pair of screws at the back to attach your positive and negative DC excitement and a single UK AC 13 amp plug socket on the front. Not the bow, the front. It's not a boat plus a lithium or lead acid selector and a source voltage display so that you know if you're pushing your luck. I pushed my luck, so I proceeded straight to releasing the electricity from the high power isolator switch and it zoomed over to the inverter, which confirmed that we did indeed have the appropriate number of volts on offer. It powers up a jigsaw, which is good news. Yes, once again brand snobs, a Black & Decker. I love it, it cuts things wonderfully. The ammeter I installed back in the bad old days of Covid jumped into action, which is endearing and I have some explaining to do. This huge expanse of worktop here was ideal when I was actually using the boat really as a workshop as much as a boat, but it's time for that to now uh, at least be modified. And so I'm going to halve the size of it. I'm gonna keep this, this end here. It's gonna stay uh, on the same structure as before, but I'm actually gonna remove this entire section which is towards the stern. Uh, I will keep most of the metal work, but I'll remove some of the, the cross pieces. And that, that means that we can actually open up the space here for seating, for storage and all sorts of other things. And it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not going to encroach upon the area quite so much as it does now because it really is quite imposing in this internal area. It's a nice green at the moment because that's the only, um, it was the only high quality, uh, moisture proof, cheap paint I could find at the time. But 
as in line with pretty much all my policies on colours, we try and make things as neutral as possible, which means that then it doesn't confuse cameras and give us weird colour casts when we're trying to film. Uh, also, I just don't think that green is very Allen, so that's going to change. Exciting. The two planks on the top rack of the racking unscrewed and came away with minimal complaint, both from them and me. The inner structure of the racking is now exposed for all to see, and may make some of you very cross, despite the fact that it's been totally solid for four years now, but we'll see to those washers later. The first job is to remove some of the cross braces from the stern end of the upper racking, spanners to the ready, and before long I need to get to the cutting. I do have the full size angle grinder on location now, but it does get rather excited in enclosed confines. Now I considered using uh, the, well, it's not a huge grinder, but the angle grinder, along with my new um, powerful inverter. Uh, but the sparks are very, very hard to control and I'm already using actually some of my soundproofing here, which I know is flame retardant, so it's quite a good way of sort of catching all the sparks so I can hoover them up later on once they've cooled down. But anyway, um, as you can also see, I'm actually gonna go with my smaller mini grinder here. It's just a lot more controllable. It will be slightly slower, but actually, I mean, I. That was this sort of five seconds work um, as a test. It makes reasonably fast work of it and it is much more controllable. I, I'll have to go through a number of battery charges, but I've got two batteries. My small cordless grinder lacks the same punch, but is much better behaved in how it sprays sparks less than everywhere. You know what? I've got about halfway through and I'm not being very clever here. All I need to do is unbolt, done that one, three more quite large bolts, which isn't that hard. Um, and I can just take this entire section off, take it outside, cut it, bring it back in again. I'll do that. Okay, so there's no need to cause a mess inside after all. And with the box section fixed in place, the angles were getting really rather awkward too. So I unbolted the rest of the bits and bobs up the other end and released it. All those people incandescent that the racking wasn't welded together back in the day will be similarly incandescent that I'm now able to merely unbolt the structure when deciding to make changes. Outside, sparks flew freely without concern, and I continued to use the mini grinder, which really is a trooper for a cordless gadget costing less than £30. The reason I'm not using the larger angle grinder being that I've not yet got around to setting up mains hookup power at the marina. I tidied up the ends with the flat wheel disc, something that we didn't do in the first place when building the racking, and then sprayed the bare cut steel with some cold galvanising zinc coating, which is better than nothing. I'm taking the opportunity to swap out these spring washers that were used liberally in the original racking assembly. They do appear to have done okay, with no loose nuts, but I'm changing them for Nord locks as I luckily have some in M10 size. Hopefully this can give you a sense of the area I'm opening up. Right, I know it doesn't look much now, uh, but this will be my seating area, this will all be padded, there'll be padded area here for your back to lean up against. And my main reasoning here is because I found that on the voyages the mini trips going up the eastern coast. It hasn't been that comfortable sitting on these, um, well, these seats on both sides because the, the walls curve in slightly and that means you can't really sit comfortably. And so I'm thinking actually of dedicating those areas to storage, which was originally going to be in the middle. And then this can be more of a more of an area where people can use the computer or to sit down or if, if you want to uh, catch 40 winks without setting up a bunk. And then when it's not being used for that, it's quite easy for box storage. And so you can pile up um, these tubs or these boxes here up to about yay high. You can strap the whole thing down, lots of eyelets, and then that'll be secure for passages. So it's kind of like a multi, multi-purpose uh, thing. And then we've still got this high area here for uh, as like a mini workbench as opposed to the giant two meter plus workbench we had before. I'm keeping this end rail and adding some soft padding to it, but I also plan to run two grab poles up to the ceiling, which can double as cable conduit. Also, I'm going to box in both sides of the box section to make a slim vented storage zone, which can house the inverter and some other gadgets. Lots more stabilization research and work coming up and drone drama and electric motors. Gripping upcoming installments are guaranteed. A quick one before I say bye. Thousands of you are wisely in possession of copies of my various Arctic books. Whether you've bought direct from local bookshops or Big Bad Amazon, I have a favour to ask. I'm rather down on customer reviews. So, readers, even if you have not bought from these places, I'd enormously appreciate a review, be it short or long, on these two specific platforms. Amazon.co.uk, which I think .com and .ca and so on accounts can do as well. Also on Goodreads, which helps me too. I don't usually end with a thank you, 
but thank you in advance, and bye.